My name is Ed Boyden. I direct uh, a neuroengineering group at MIT um, and also co-direct the Center for Neurobiological Engineering there. And our goal is to build tools that let us map, observe the dynamics of, and control the dynamics of complex biological systems like the brain. Over the last 10 years, we and our colleagues have been building a tool set uh, of optogenetic tools that allow you to turn on and off populations in neurons with light. Last year, uh, we published a couple papers which we think represent um, nearly optimal tools. For example, we published the first truly red light drivable activator uh, called Crimson, and it's about 45 nanometers redshifted more than any other previous one. And so now many groups are using it to activate neurons, even in freely moving animals with red light, even non-invasively. We also published a molecule that we call Kronos, which is extremely high speed. It's more than twice as fast um, as uh, other molecules, uh, but it also is very light sensitive, and that allows it to be kind of a good all-around activator. Finally, we published a red light shifted molecule uh, that allows you to use red light to turn off neurons that we call JAWS, and that can be used to do non-invasive silencing of neurons. So we're very excited that classical population optogenetics, where you turn on or off a set of cells, might have the majority of the tools that it really needs. Um, and our attention has shifted really to understanding single cell optogenetics. Can we turn on or off individual cells in a complex network? And that requires significantly um, more focal abilities to turn on and off specific neurons. Um, and it involves all sorts of interesting molecular as well as optical strategies. But there's a problem. We don't have actually a complete list of the cell types of the brain. We don't have genetic handles to let us target specific kinds of cells for activation or silencing uh, beyond several that were found a bit by chance. So increasingly, we realized that we had to find out a way to find the shape and the molecular composition of the cells of the brain. To do that, many groups have been turning to technologies known as super-resolution microscopy technologies. And some of the inventors of these tools won the Nobel Prize last year in chemistry. But there's a problem. These tools are great for looking at the nanoscale, um, but they're not great at imaging large 3D objects like the brain. So we decided, after some time experimenting with these classical super-resolution methods, why don't we just make everything bigger? So what we do is we take uh, brain tissues, preserved brain tissues, and we embed them in a really dense polymer matrix. And this poly polymer matrix, which now winds its way around all the biomolecules of the brain, is a swellable polymer, not unlike the kind found in baby diapers. So now, if we add water, this polymer will swell, and as it does that, it'll take the brain along with it. So already, in a paper we recently published in Science, we showed that we could swell brain tissues 100-fold in volume. And it's isotropic, that is, nearby molecules are pushed apart from each other, and they're all, they're all pushed apart evenly. So it's almost like you draw a picture on a balloon, and you blow up the balloon, the shape is the same, it's just bigger. So now, we can actually do imaging with nanoscale precision in a large 3D object because we've magnified it physically, chemically, not optically. There are many biological and medical questions where you would love to be able to see a large tissue with nanoscale precision. Just as a few examples, uh, tumors, cancers, have uh, some similar structural pro properties to the brain. They're large, they're macroscopic, and yet the actual pathology, the signaling complexes that cause a cell to divide, or the signaling complexes that cause blood vessels to sprout and form angiogenic um, feeders to keep the tumor alive, or the metastasis processes where a cell starts to free itself from a tumor and migrate throughout the body. Those, of course, are organized by protein complexes that are themselves coordinated at the nanoscale. So we've had a lot of uh, approaches by people who want to image tumor samples and other kinds of samples um, that, uh, that are large 3D objects with nanoscale precision. There are other processes as well. Uh, aging. So when a tissue ages, there are many cells in a tissue and they age in different ways. And so if we want to understand the nanopathology of aging, how genes change, how proteins change, how sugars change, we need to do that in a cell-specific and comprehensive way. Another example is autoimmune diseases. So immune cells, again, operate using signaling complexes that are organized with nanoscale precision. And yet, if you want to understand type 1 diabetes, where the pancreas is starting to be attacked by these endogenous cells, again, there's a need to image a large 3D object with nanoscale precision. So there's many, many examples in biology and medicine where you would love to be able to see a large 3D object with nanoscale precision in order to see how those normal or pathological processes contribute to the overall emergent operation of the system. So the Brain Initiative is about making technologies for mapping, recording, controlling, and building brains. And uh, the reason it's about tools is because the existing technologies are not powerful enough to map or record or control entire brains. 
they're large, extended, three-dimensional objects that operate at really high speeds, millisecond time scale resolution. So if you think about it, that's a really hard problem. How can you image all the activity in a 3D structure at a kilohertz? How can you pinpoint where a nanoscale receptor is, but you have to do it in a large 10 centimeter scale brain, like the human brain? So um, our group has participated in the Brain Initiative from pretty much the very beginning. I was invited to the White House in April of 2000, 2013 when it was announced. Um, and throughout 2014, uh, we and others have, have been trying to sculpt it by figuring out what the big needs are in neuroscience. And uh, recently, um, some of the uh, funding agencies have started to actually fund brain initiative projects. So for example, in late 2014, uh, the National Institutes of Health announced the first batch of 58 projects that were funded by the Brain Initiative, um, several of which our group is playing a key role in. So it's been very exciting to see neurotechnology go from sort of a quirky, bizarre field um, into a major national endeavor. And we're continuing to both propose projects for the Brain Initiative and to help steer uh, various avenues. And interestingly as well, to recruit more engineers into neuroscience. You know, most fields of engineering have not yet been applied to the brain. And if we can find ways to help people bring in new nanoparticles, new optical materials, new um, strategies for microscopy and optical interfacing into neuroscience, there's going to be a lot of growth in the years to come, both from a, a substantive standpoint, new mysteries to solve and inventions to make, and from a procedural standpoint, this initiative will hopefully continue for about 10 years and fund a lot of new technologies for brain mapping. Our main focus is on tools that can have broad application on many questions. Um, because neuroscience is a very democratic field. You know, how do you know what is more important? To figure out memory or solve emotion or treat Alzheimer's or understand flight and how it's controlled by the motor system? You know, there's all sorts of interesting problems. And so I think that if we can help engineers understand the broad classes of problem and how to build tools of universal importance, that this will be one way to contribute to the Brain Initiative.